would you like to be an engineer of great integrity? The Engineers Table is here for you. A free platform for engineers to engage online. Working closely with the Grow a Graduate aspect of SACE Growing Forward, empower yourselves with the skills of tomorrow and be part of engineering breakthroughs of tomorrow. engaging with professionals, generating ideas, revolutionizing industries, and creating the future. Let us help you build as you are built. with hundreds of South Africa's engineers. A very good evening to everyone, especially our students from across the country, as well as the learning institutions. Welcome to our very first installment of a series of webinars put together by the SICE Academy, together with the SICE Support Our Students, or SOS leg of the institution's going forward strategy. These webinars are aimed particularly at fostering and catalyzing student engagement, exposure, and participation in the industry. My name is Karabo, and I'm the champion of the SICE SOS leg. Now, before we commence for the, with the event of the day, I'd like to just go through a few housekeeping rules for the webinar. Um, first and importantly, can all our participants please keep their microphones muted at all, at all times? We would like to have a very smooth uh, event with minimal disturbances. Um, we do have a chat se section on this platform, so for any comments or questions, uh, please put these in the chat section. 
the questions for the Q and A session will actually be taken from this chat section um, later on in the event. During the session, there will be a poll running in the chat section. Please do participate in the poll and provide us your insights from the presentation that has been given. Uh, the webinar is being recorded should should and should be put up on the SICE YouTube page in the coming few days. Uh, the, web the webinar began promptly at half past five and should end at seven o'clock. The presentation should be about an hour and we should have a 20 minute Q&A towards the end. Now to introduce Sam, our presenter for the day. Sam is a professional civil engineer, a professional project manager and a dispute resolution specialist. He has a qualification from the University of Durban Westville, Pretoria, WITS, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Harvard Business School. He is a fellow and honorary fellow of the South African Institute of Civil Engineering and was president of SICE in 2006. He is a fellow of the South African Academy of Engineers and the Association of Arbitrators. In 1993, he founded a design and management firm in which he retired in 2011 to focus his efforts on dispute resolution and voluntary work. Sam has served on many boards in the corporate arena councils of statutory and voluntary organizations such as the CIDB, EXA, CISA, and of course IC. In 2006, Sam initiated the first report card for South Africa's infrastructure and has been the principal author of all reports since. In 2017, he was awarded the prestigious gold medal in engineering, making him one of only 22 uh, recipients in the 118 year history of SICE. Sam, we welcome you to our event for the day. And if you are ready, you may begin your presentation for our guests. Thanks, Karabo. Thank you very much. Can I be heard clearly? Yes, yeah, you are clear. You are clear on, on, on our side, Sam. And uh, can you see my screen? Yes, your presentation has just gone up. Uh, okay. All seems to be well. Great. Karaba, I'm not sure people can use the chat as you suggested. I think there seems to be a problem. So you might have to manage that when it comes to questions and answers by having people raise their hands or something like that. Um, All right. Not a problem. In, in... All right. Uh, good. I suppose it's being this time of the year, it's about evening. So good evening, everybody. Um, the, the, the subject of my talk is patch and pray. Is this our asset management strategy? Um, a little bit about what we're going to talk about. It's a little general stuff about SICE and civil engineering, and then get into what public infrastructure is, which is what uh, the infrastructure report cards have reported upon, uh, upon. Why is this important to us in particular as professionals or near professionals in the civil engineering arena? Does that infrastructure work? And if not, why doesn't it work? And why you are crucial to the future of the country, not just infrastructure. And along the ways, as is my way, there'll be a few distractions and deviations and reflections, um, but I'll certainly finish on time. So a little bit about SICE. Um, I noticed that Karabo even said Institute. It's an institution. And uh, recently I was um, external examiner and, and every script I received of dissertations had the acronym SICE, S-A-I-C-E, and different words to go with that acronym. Not a single one of which was correct. It is the South African Institution of Civil Engineering. It's not for civil engineers, it's for all people involved in civil engineering, and it is also for the knowledge and the skills related. It's a learned society, so it's, it's very broad. So it's a large embracing family. Um, I also think that civil engineering, like infrastructure, is a very unsexy term. And I wonder if we wouldn't be better known if we were called qualities, quality of life professionals. You know, the difference between civil engineering or why civil engineering is called what it is, is to differentiate it from military engineering. And I would call those kill peas. We'd be qual peas. 
Um, just a bit about SISI. It was started in 1903, so it's it's a very old organization. It has a lot of members, the largest organization in the built environment, certainly, um, and one of the largest learned societies in the country in any sector. It has members from across the board, public sector, private sector, from all walks of life, and it includes a very, very broad cross section. It's not representative yet of the demographics of South Africa, and that's something we have to work at. Uh, women and black people are underrepresented, especially in the engineers category. But what we do know is that SISI has credibility because it does not have a commercial outlook. People are members as individuals, not as companies. And uh, we tend to remain focused on the, the skills, the, the knowledge, and the practice of civil engineering. And increasingly, SISI, over the last two decades or so, has become more and more an active participant in civil society issues. So where previously it kept to itself it now comments on a, a wide range of issues. And the infrastructure report card is one of those. Here's my first deviation uh, to talk about horse manure and flight. So in 1903, the other significant event that happened elsewhere in the world was that the Wright brothers, Orville and, and Wilbur Wright, um, are kind of accepted to have done the first powered flight. Now, the, these guys were, they weren't aircraft builders, obviously, they, they were bicycle builders. And if you look at this picture very carefully, you can actually see the cogs um, that are taken from bicycles with bicycle chains that they use to power their two propellers. And, and this thing flew about the same length as a wingspan of a Boeing 747. That was the first powered flight. And at that time, with this first aircraft, the infrastructure at the time was based on horses and carts, carriages. And just 10 years earlier, there had been a major conference, a crisis conference, it was called the Horse Manure Crisis Conference of 1894. Um, and it was to deal with the fact that there was so much of horse manure in London that they were afraid that uh, within 50 years, there would be under, 50, uh, under 10 feet of horse shit. And of course, what happened soon after that was cars came in and the horse manure problem disappeared. And just recently, of course, we had two billionaires uh, who went into space. And, and both of these were quite exciting. Just This is just two weeks ago. I'm sure many of you have seen this. The one on the left is the Bezos, uh, one that looks much more like a rocket. Some people liken it to a sexual object, which I'm not going to talk about. But it looks more like a rocket than Branson's one, which is in the middle. and the 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 Virgin Galactical uh, Galactic um, spacecraft is in two parts. It's got a mothership which takes it up to fifty thousand feet, and then it's got the central um, rocket spaceship that detaches and then flies off into space and uh, um, and hopefully breaks the the common line which is 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface, and that's seen as the boundary of space. Well, as it turns out, Bezos did get into space, but Branson didn't quite. He only got up about 85 kilometers, so not quite into space. But neither of these would be classified as astronauts. And that's why I'm talking about this, because I really like this guy. This is Alan Shepard, who was the first astronaut from the West. Yuri Gagarin, of course, had flown into space and done a full orbit of the Earth. Um, Alan Shepard only did a suborbital flight, but he did get well into space, 115 miles up. 
But there's two quotations from Alan Shepard that I really like that are relevant to us. And, and the first is this one. Uh, he was asked when he was sitting at the end of this controlled explosion, which was the rocket underneath him, the Redstone rocket, what, what was he thinking about? And he says, well, it's a very sobering feeling to be up in space and realize that your safety factor is determined by the lowest bidder in a government contract. And I think there are many people in our industry who will say a lot of the reasons for the problems we have in infrastructure is simply that we choose to use the wrong criteria. Let's get into infrastructure. Public infrastructure is the basis upon which all of our progress and prosperity is leveraged. It's a crucial part of what makes a nation a nation. It's there for all the citizens of the country and it is a public good. I think what we have to recognize is that a key pillar of apartheid, and we can't get away from this, was the provision and access to infrastructure in an unequal way. And we are still dealing with that legacy. And that is why, in fact, the access to infrastructure is enshrined in the Constitution. It's quite unusual that our Constitution, compared to any other in the world, has this, this central enshrinement of the access to infrastructure and services as a part of the Constitution. And, and by the way, procurement as well is defined in the Constitution as to uh, how it must work. So what, what we have is this idea of a public good and a public good is an economic uh, term and it refers to items that are non-excludable and non-rivalrous, meaning that everyone has access to it and it is not diminished by its use. Uh, a really good example of this would be fresh air or knowledge. Those, those are things, you know, you breathe the air and others can breathe the air. It doesn't diminish it because you are using it. And, uh, and if you are not everyone has access to it. This infrastructure works at three levels. At the first level, infrastructure provides health and safety, uh, clean water, access to good sanitation uh, and, and shelter. That provides the basic requirements of, of citizens. At the next level, it engenders social mobility and, and access to opportunity. And, and here, you're not just underpinning life expectancy increases, but you're providing basic schooling, health facilities, electricity, transportation, which allows social interaction and access to opportunities for work, for example. And then at the final level, economic infrastructure and catalytic infrastructure, uh, things like the ports and rail and airports and even your Tibet colleges that enable growth and create the jobs that people need for those, those opportunities. The public asset is all the infrastructure that is either owned or commissioned by government or by the state. And we've made very great strides since democracy. I think a, a, an important feature of how many more people have had access to water and electricity since 1994 is that this rolling out of infrastructure has also brought with it a reduction in reliability. So we've got increased accessibility, but decreased reliability. And we'll talk about that in a little, in a, in a short while. This is our joint inheritance. And it is something that we are entrusted with to pass on to our children and the generations to come. And that's very important for us to understand. It's hardly ever talked about in that way. A key
key aspect of infrastructure being a public good, being accessible to everybody means that the poor and the disadvantaged have as much access to this infrastructure as the wealthy. And in that sense, the access to infrastructure moderates those inequalities. And in fact, infrastructure investment is one of the sure ways to address this difficulty that we have with poverty and access to opportunity along with inequalities. But the care of this public asset must be shared between the state and the user. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, I seem to have missed a slide there, but anyway. Here we go. The way in which we manage this asset has to be embedded within the organizations. Too often that asset management happens on an ad hoc basis, but unless it is embedded in there, in, included in the way in which we do all management issues related to assets, for example, life cycle costing uh, from cradle to grave type of, of management, it's not going to be managed well. There are many, many asset management uh, standards and guides, and, and they're produced ad nauseum within the country. Sadly, they are often not used. What SIC has decided to do is to say, hang on, if you don't have a good picture of what the condition of infrastructure is, then you can't really manage it. And that is where we come in with the infrastructure report card. This is what is covered. The 10 sectors that we cover in infrastructure reporting, and there are 29 sectors at, at the last report card. We've had three major report cards produced. The first was in 2006. And then at a roughly five year, six year interval since then, we produced others. We're in the process right now of working on the, on the fourth one. I think what we need to understand is when we look at this, this list of infrastructure, is that they're all interconnected. If one form of infrastructure fails, another form is placed under pressure as you would see with, for example, freight moving off rail and onto the roads. They overstress the roads and the roads get damaged, and then you've got a problem with both rail and roads, and so on. So they're all interconnected, and the deterioration of one causes congestion in another. What we're trying to do with this report card is to highlight the value and the importance of infrastructure to draw attention to its condition and the importance of the professions that work on it. Now, at this point, we're supposed to have the first poll. I'm not sure we can do that. Tabeleng, is it possible? Uh, not yet, Sam. The chat is locked at the moment, so I think let's see um, as we go through the presentation if we're able to do so later. Okay. What I'll ask you to do as, as participants is to look at this, this definition of infrastructure as we've got it. This is qualitative, it's descriptive. But I think as people versed with engineering, if you were to look at any of these definitions, you would fairly easily be able to give a quantitative grade to it. So for example, world class, a grade of A, comparable to the best internationally and so on. Well, you're going to say that's about an 80 to 100% mark. Likewise, B, in good condition, can handle stress. C, satisfactory for now. It will find it difficult to deal with peak periods because it gets stressed. A D grade is at risk of failure. It's, it's, it's not well maintained. It finds it difficult to cope with the existing demands. And unless something happens, there might even be um, 
the public might be exposed to danger. And then an E is fairly clear, it's unfit for purpose or it's on the verge of failure. So I think we, we understand, we can understand what these grades are, are trying to describe. Now, cast your eye over, your mind's eye over the infrastructure as you experience it. And just take something like national roads and your municipal roads and ask yourself, what grade would you give that? And then think about what grade you might give the country as a whole. What grade would you give it? The way in which we do the infrastructure report card very briefly is we've had a partnership with the CSRR, which has been very, very useful. And they've been very accommodating and generous. Um, we're not sure if that relationship will continue on this next report card. But what we've done is the CSRR primarily would produce baseline research reports on each sector. SISI experts would then look at that and supplement by closing the gaps or where there's a, an area that needs uh, uh, supplementation. Uh, and we also work with our sister organizations like the Institute of uh, Electrical Engineers. The infrastructure report card team then takes those reports and synthesizes it from 50 to 100 pages in each sector down to 120, uh, 1200 words for each sector. And that is what goes into the actual report document. I, I should have said that if you haven't yet downloaded that document, it's available on the SICE website, uh, each of the three reports. And you can see the way in which they've developed over time. And then for each report, we look at the most current information and look at the critical matters that are emerging. And we put those into critical issues that need to be addressed and look at the trends that are developing. That draft report is then reviewed by the SISI divisions and sector leaders, and it's moderated. And we produce the gradings, and eventually we have a launch and publish it. And then downstream of the publication of the report, we have uh, a number of engagements with decision makers, We've presented to portfolio committees within parliament with all the ministries involved with infrastructure and the private sector as well. It's a huge effort. And apart from what the CSRR does in house, which is to pay for their own research and so on, the rest of it is done as voluntary work. So this is all work of volunteers, enormous effort and, and, and very useful work. Just to give you an idea of what the type of thing we would do if we don't have the data. And, and this is for water supply as an example. So what I described was you've got grades that have ratings in terms of qualitative. We then give an equivalent score to that in, in percentages. And then for water supply, for example, we would try to find out from the municipalities as an example. How many pipe breaks do you get per 100 kilometers per year? So each year, how many pipe breaks are complained about in your municipality? And we give an allocation of those. So if there was 20 pipe breaks. Well, that's sitting in the 70 to 80 percent mark. We also look at non-revenue water, which is what all municipalities by law need to manage. This is uh, lost revenue due to pipe leaks. And these two items give us a very good idea of the condition of infrastructure. The next area is to look at the performance of that infrastructure. So the blue drop score is, is, is uh, uh, a, a widely accepted but underused measure of the quality of water uh, performance and, and, and infrastructure condition. And if we don't have that, then we simply ask them, in terms of the testing that you do on the water that comes out of your water treatment works, what percentage of those tests are compliant? If it's more than 99.5%, you, 
you get a, a 80% to 100% mark. If it's less than 97.5, in other words, 2.5% non-compliance means that it's an E. And in that way, we can develop um, grades. So I'm not gonna go through much more of that and you can look at the grades. I'm going to run through the grading fairly quickly. In the water sanitation and solid waste management section, and, and, and of course this is very important because clean water is responsible for avoiding typhoid and cholera and, and many other waterborne diseases. And sanitation, of course, uh, poor sanitation means that the water in the water courses is poor and spreads diseases. And that goes downstream into other water purification works, which makes it harder for them to produce drinking water. Solid waste management, likewise, is a hazard to the public if it's not disposed of properly or collected properly. And you can see the grades are all C's and D's. There is one E, and that is sanitation in those areas outside of major urban areas. And that's a real problem because poor sanitation, as I said, is what exposes children to disease. If we look at, this is a map of the country with the major ports and the, the um, airports and, and railway lines. And together with the road network, this constitutes the major arterials. And, you know, I can't help looking at these maps of South Africa with infrastructure mapped on it and thinking of a body with arteries and veins and nerve networks. And these are the arteries and the veins. This is the blood flow of the nation. As uh, people and goods move between places from the ports to the hinterland and from uh, place to place, it, it's like the pulsing and, and the movement of, of, you know, bodily fluids. Um, we have nine airports that are operated by AXA. We've got nine harbors, seven, seven of them are commercial. And then 33,000 kilometers of rail line in the country. And of that, about 1,500 kilometers are heavy freight lines, the, the, the coal line and the iron ore line that go down to Richards Bay and to Saldana Bay. And most of that railway line, apart from Khao Train, is uh, Cape Gauge, which is three foot six inches, which is narrower than the international uh, standard. Uh, but wider than what would be normally called narrow gauge. There's, there is a small proportion that is narrow gauge. And a lot of this rail has been gradually improving over the last five to 10 years. This is a picture of the, um, the ore line train. These are extremely long trains. They're, they're some of the longest trains in the world. And, and this, this one that I've got a picture of is almost four kilometers long. And it has a number of uh, drivetrains scattered through the, the, the length of the train. And if you sit on a bridge watching this go under you, it's mesmerizing. It just goes on and on and on and on. The road network, similarly, is huge. It's We've got 750,000 kilometers of uh, roads in the country. Most of it is gravel. Um, the national road network, which you see here in blue, is 21,000 kilometers, and it's been growing gradually from the establishment of Sanral when it started at about, I think, 8,000 kilometers. It's more than doubled. Um, then there's you know the, all the secondary and tertiary network, and in the road section again, you, you transportation section you'll see C's and D's, but you also see a few B's. Airports and ports 
get a high grade along with national roads and heavy haul freight lines, the, the Sishin, Saldana, and, and uh, uh, the coal line that I mentioned. Those are all above average. And it's a good thing that they are. I mean, airports is a good example to use. One of the reasons airports get a good grade is because the, the, the quality of airports is governed by international standards. Of course, we want international airlines to come to South Africa. And unless those airports can comply with those international standards, uh, those airlines simply will not fly here. So ICAO standards set the requirements and the airports company fulfills those requirements. But AXA is also a profitable SOE. And in many instances, you will find, for example, with Sanrel and, and AXA, that where international standards are a requirement and they comply with them, it makes these SOEs far more efficient and effective as well. Khautrain is recent and was recent when we did this evaluation in 2017, and it receives the only A grade in the entire report card. If we were to do that report now, as, as we are busy with, we might well give it a slightly different grade because of congestion on the line. The other E is for provincial, metropolitan, and municipal gravel roads. And so the two worst grades out of all the 29 subsectors in this report card were for sanitation outside the major urban areas and for um, gravel roads. This is just a grid map of generation and transmission of electricity. And um, it shows that a lot of the generation is up where the coal mines are and then transmission lines take it down. The transmission section of electricity is pretty effective. The generation, as we know, has become problematic in the last few years with Kusile and Medupi having those problems. Health facilities are scattered throughout the country. Just to give you an idea of the extent of electricity, 95% of our electricity is generated by ESCOM. And most of that, 86% of all electricity is coal generated, which is dirty and we wanted that to change. Hopefully in, in the next reports, we will find that there's an increasing amount of renewables. We've got 32,000 kilometers of transmission lines and that goes to 187 municipalities with about 60% of it to industry and 15% to commerce and the rest to residential. In terms of, of health facilities, there's about just under 4,000 of the total of 6,000 uh, health facilities are owned by the state and 70% of South Africa's population uses public health care. In this Sorry, next, uh, yes. Just to disturb you for a bit. Um... Tabulang was able to put up the uh, to get the poll to work. So if you want to do the next poll, um, uh, it is available and it, it does function now. Excellent, excellent, good. So I hope people have have answered that first poll when it came up, um, and we can look at the results later. I can't see that because I'm sharing my screen. So I'm sure Karabo will keep me in touch with uh, when we close that. Although the first poll wasn't done, uh, so I think we can move oh, on to the second poll if, if you're ready. All right. Okay, cool. Uh, 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 we'll call up the second poll when it's appropriate. Um, so these are the health facilities, and then I'll, I'll, I'll move very quickly through education. We have 23,000 schools. Sadly, about 140 of them were destroyed in the recent riots. Uh, 26 universities and, and 50 uh, Tivit colleges, and they're throughout the country. And these are the sort of the grades we've given in the past for electricity, healthcare, and education. Uh, again, 
B's and C's and D's. And the best grade is for transmission in the uh, uh, of electricity, which is, again, critical because most generation happens in the high felt and that transmission is crucial for us to get the electricity to the uh, coastal cities as well as the hinterland, the inland cities. And the overall, we gave a grade of D plus. Now, just to give you a feel for this, in 2006, when we first did the infrastructure report card, we developed a grade of uh, D plus. In 2011, just after the World Cup, when we'd invested so heavily in infrastructure, the grade went up to a C minus. And since then it has declined to a D plus. That was in 2017. We'll be doing a new grade, hopefully next year, in 2022. And it'd be interesting to see what that next grade is. And th there's a summary there, you can see that the majority were C's and D's, which means that our infrastructure on average is average at best. Much of it is at risk of failure. And this begs the question, what is our relationship with infrastructure? And I think at this point, doubling, if you can put up the, the second poll, And perhaps I should just hold on with this slide for a moment. If that poll is up. I've just loaded the poll. Um, just let's just give it a few seconds to come through in the chat. Thank you. OK. So what I'd like you to do is to. Indicate in terms of this. Description of our infrastructure. You have six options and and. Choose more than one, don't choose more than three, one or two or three options um, of what you think are the critical issues that affect the condition of infrastructure. Is it abuse by the users? Is it the fact that we don't have enough professionals? We don't have enough funding? Which of those do you feel? are the most important in affecting the condition of South Africa's infrastructure. And while you're doing that, I think I'll move on. I think a crucial issue is what is our relationship with infrastructure? You know, we have, we can find many reasons and I'll describe some of the reasons we, we found in our investigation. But we've got to ask these philosophical questions. Do we view infrastructure as responsible for separation and deprivation, separating people and depriving them of things? the inequality that exists? Do we view infrastructure as the cause of destruction, pollution, when it fails, or even, for example, coal-fired power plants? Is it a source of exploitation and corruption? And, I, you know, I think in, in this respect, if we were to think about something like infrastructure in the arts. Uh, I think of uh, the late Yuma Sakela's song, Stimela. And if you're a jazz or a blues fan, you no doubt know the song. And I'll, I'll read some of the lyrics and there's nothing that replaces the way Brahu would say this. He would ring that cowbell and then he would start, he'd say, and he goes, there is a train that comes from Namibia and Malawi. There is a train that comes from Zambia and Zimbabwe. There is a train that comes from Angola and Mozambique, from Lesotho, from Botswana, from Swaziland, from all the hinterland of Southern and Central Africa. 
This train carries young and old African men who are conscripted to come and work on contract in the golden mineral mines of Johannesburg and its surrounding metropolis. 16 hours or more a day for almost no pay. And then he talks about the conditions under which they work and the deprivation that they have to work under. And then he says, and when they hear that choo-choo train, a chugging and a pumping and a smoking and a pushing and a pumping and a crying and a steaming and a chugging and a hoo-hoo, they always cuss and they curse the coal train, the coal train that brought them to Johannesburg. If this is the relationship that our infrastructure evokes in us, then we might well see it as the cause of our problems. There's another song that comes to me, which is The Road to Hell by Chris Rea, another great slide guitarist. Um, and and he, his, it, it says, I'm standing by the river, but the river doesn't flow, the water doesn't flow. It boils with every poison you can think of. And then goes on to say, this is no upwardly mobile freeway. This is the road to hell. You know, there's a lot of songs like that that bring out this relationship we have with roads and rail and air and so on. And there's another aspect too. When the in the private sector, when we look at opportunities to implement infrastructure, very frequently we don't say, well, hang on, is this the right infrastructure? Should we be doing this? because we are dependent on those clients to give us that work and we want the work more than we spend time thinking about whether it's the right thing to do and the private sector and the public sector are in this terrible relationship of corruption so is that how we see infrastructure or do we in fact see infrastructure as an opportunity to improve the quality of life of our people as a whole host of assets that need to be protected and to be held in trust for our children and the generations to come because to be sure the public infrastructure that we are talking about is the greatest asset that this nation has as a fixed asset a permanent asset it has been growing over the years and it's now worth trillions of rands. In fact, in this current medium term expenditure framework, Treasury's expenditure framework uh, period, we will spend over 800 billion rand on that infrastructure. And we do that every year. This is an asset that we need to protect and treasure. And it's a means also for us to adjust the inequality that happens in our country. The spatial inequality that happened through apartheid needs to be corrected. All sorts of other inequality that exists can be corrected and at least to some extent through infrastructure, we give, which gives people the opportunity to improve their lives and lift themselves out of poverty. So what is the role of the user in this? What happens when infrastructure is damaged, destroyed, or abused, including through non-payment for services rendered? You know, I had used this slide in the past, and it shows an improvement from 2011 through to 2015. In 2016, it also improved. This is the losses suffered by PRASA, just one agency. Around 120, 130, 140 million rands a year spent to fix stuff that has been damaged through theft and vandalism and arson in South Africa. This is our assets that are being destroyed in this way. Well, it puts us to shame that in 2015, this was around 100 million rands of damage. Last year, this last year that's gone past, that amount was 1 billion rands for PRASA, 10 times as much. 
It went from 100 million to 1,000 million in one year. This is not lack of maintenance. This is not neglect. This is not something we can blame PROSA for, unless you want to blame them for not having policemen every 10 meters. This is our national shame, and we must see it that way. We have the right to protest, yes. We do not have the right to destroy the legacy of our children. But there is an issue also for maintenance. And it's long been known within the sector that maintenance is neglected. There was a maintenance strategy produced in the early 2000s that said we must spend money on maintenance because if we only spend money after something is broken, we're wasting money. And yet, there is underspending on infrastructure. This is where this topic, patch and pray, comes from. Um, in 2007, after that first report card, I was interviewed, and on the spur of the moment, somebody asked me, somebody asked me, how would you describe our infrastructure strategy? And I said, well, we patch and pray. That's what we do. And although that is not the norm, it is still not unusual. We still do spend a lot of time just patching and praying. And let, let me say, to patch in, in terms of um, the Oxford in English Dictionary, it is to make a temporary repair, especially hastily done. So that's what we do with maintenance. And, and to pray, I think we all pray, whether you are Muslim, Hindu, Christian, Jew, whether you are lawyer or engineer, agnostic or atheist, because to pray simply means to earnestly hope for a particular outcome. And in fact, when I was first, when I first became an arbitrator, I received a, a submission from one of the disputants, and it said at the end of it, our prayer is, and it was what they wanted me to find. So suddenly they were praying to me, and, and everyone knows I am not a god. Um, so we all pray in different ways. We pray for a lack of destruction. We pray for maintenance. Maintenance is crucial, and we need to move from this idea of patch and pray to finding and fixing. And for that, we need improved systems and we need improved capability. Otherwise, we can't. We're always going to be chasing a reactive arrangement. But we need to get to a stage where we can predict when we need to maintain so that we can prevent breakdowns. And for that, we need functional institutions that have reliable data. So these are the critical factors that we found within those three areas. If we don't have really the right people, and, and we talk about all the time, the fact that people are our greatest and most important asset. No, the right people are. And we need to have knowledgeable clients with enough skill within the client body to be able to procure what's required. We need to have informed professionals and ethical professionals who are able to provide what is required, not simply what is stated as needed or wanted, but rather what is needed. And we need to have a broad plethora of, of skilled people at every level. Together with that, we need institutions that have strong governance and good cultures so that you have the right systems in place, you have processes, you have very clear ideas of what people are responsible for and the ability for those institutions to do what is their, what is their knitting. And finally, you need data and information. Data is the new gold. Without data, 
we cannot make the right decisions. We need information on our assets, what is their condition, what they're able to do and what they're not able to do compared to what is required. We, South Africa is the most urbanized of all the countries in Africa. And in fact, one of the more urbanized countries in the world. The average in the world is around 50%. We just crossed that threshold last year. South Africa is well over 60% urbanized, which gives us enormous opportunities because infrastructure is more effective where you've got urbanization. But it also means that we need to serve this increasing demand that happens in our cities. And without the right information and data, we are not able to leapfrog existing technologies and create innovation. So people, the right people with the right information can create those predictive responses that we need and they can do life cycle management and effective planning. If we have the right data and the institutions to go with it, then institutions and the people in those institutions can make evidence-based decisions. They do not make decisions based on political expediency. If somebody comes to you and says, well, why don't we do this? Because they have a political agenda, you can say, no, the data says we've got to do something else. And it, it, it allows us to do the right things. And then finally, the right people in the right institutions gives us far better ability to leverage the private and the public sector together because you've got a knowledgeable client who can manage a, a, a profit-driven private sector. It also means that it reduces corruption because there's ethical people with good governance uh, uh, criteria in place which allows the right, the right environment to exist. And if you get all three of these, then you do have um, the sweet spot. So in, in the last report card, we said this and, and it remains applicable now. There's been a deterioration in the condition of our infrastructure, but we've made great strides since 1994. A lot of those challenges, if we address them earnestly, we can turn them around on a sixpence but a lot of them are gonna require more time and investment. None of them are impossible. We can overcome all of this, but it does take will and it, it takes determination and leadership. And this is why you are crucial. What I've described is that the most valuable permanent asset of the nation sits in your hands. Society has given you its trust. You need to take care of it. All of this asset is a public good. And all of our social and economic development is leveraged from it. And it's time for us as an infrastructure professionals to step up and do our duty. I'm reminded often of Harry Seftel who was the, for I think 50 years, was at Wits University uh, Medical uh, Faculty. And he once said, the modern civil engineer has done more to improve the health and, and lifespan of man, mankind, humankind, than all the advances in medical science. And we know how important the medical uh, fraternity is. COVID has shown us that if nothing else has. They deal with one life at a time and it's personal. And maybe that is why we see them as so valuable. It's a personal relationship. What we need to understand is that the provision of infrastructure is also personal, except that we are serving millions at a time. This is a picture that I've had on my desktop for almost 20 years. I used it when I first did the infrastructure report card to say, this is why we do it. When you see this young man who is now an adult sitting there and you wonder what are his hopes and his dreams? 
His body language shows you that he is covering himself up in shame. But this is what his life is. The indignity of it is what we need to correct. At another level, when you look at this, where does medical science separate itself from engineering? It cannot. If you can see that little cubicle there, there's a little baby in there. That baby was three days old when this picture was taken. And it depended on all of these instruments for air, for blood, for life support. And it's the infrastructure that we provide that makes it possible for medical uh, staff to provide that. An operation was required on that baby and it was done and it was successful. That was three weeks ago. This is my grandson, Jasper. And I'll be going to see him this weekend for the first time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for the sorry, Sam. Thank you very much, Sam, for the presentation. Um, I remember the first time when I was introduced to the infrastructure report card. I was still in university and um, I just couldn't get my head around the amount of work that is required to put it together. So thank you very much for for putting together this presentation and putting away um, your time to, to present it to us today. Um, now, I haven't seen any questions in the chat section, uh, but fortunately we did get some questions uh, before the webinar started. Um, so I think for the first batch of questions, we'll take questions from, from that. Um, some of these questions are quite similar to each other. Um, so I think I'll, I'll try to clump them up um, and then you can give a, a comprehensive response on all of them. Um, the first question, which I think relates to the IRC is, what is the, civil, what is the South African civil engineering community doing to publish a position on civil and structural asset strategies? and to expand more on the OHL Act requirement for annual inspections. OK, so let, let me deal with that in a more general sense in terms of compliance. We do have a real problem with uh, lack of compliance. Let me give you an example of this. Um, I think everyone would, would know uh, earlier this year, the Charlotte Mokteke Hospital had a fire. Um, the re one of the reasons why that fire was not dealt with was that the couplings used on the fire hydrants uh, was different from the couplings used on the fire uh, tenders that came from the fire department. So that when the trucks arrived, they couldn't hook up the, the, the fire hoses. And the inspections that are meant to happen are exactly to avoid that kind of problem. And there's many, many other instances where uh, there isn't enough water pressure, for example, in, in the uh, uh, fire hydrants to be able to fight fires and so on. So the lack of compliance with 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 Osh Act with general building standards is, is a real problem. We do have a need to implement that at, at, at a higher level. I think it, it varies as well from area to area. So yeah, that's a problem. And our industry as well as the public sector needs to uh, attend to that more comprehensively. OK, um, the second question. Um... And, and I did see a slide that spoke to this, um, is what are the strategies um, moving forward to rebuild the confidence in the civil engineering industry? I suppose this is the civil engineering infrastructure. Is the destruction of the state assets the only incentive towards civil construction market? Um, without foreign investors, is the industry heading towards a downward spiral? Yeah. Okay, so one of the 
consequences of the destruction of infrastructure is that it reduces confidence in investors, both local and international. Um, there's, there's a lot of industries and a lot of um, corporates who are sitting with quite healthy balance sheets and they are reviewing whether they should invest in, in investments and infrastructure, uh, new plants and so on in South Africa, given what has happened uh, historically in South Africa, but also particularly over the, the most recent unrest. Um, the consequences are far reaching. Um, I, 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 that question wasn't entirely clear to me, but I think it, it relates mostly to the fact that if you don't invest in infrastructure or you don't create the confidence for people to invest in infrastructure, then, then we will stagnate. It's, it's an interesting thing. There's a study that was done, I think, by Harvard on the value of infrastructure in developing nations as compared to developed nations. And um, there are many investment houses throughout the world that invest in infrastructure in different countries. Uh, through public-private partnerships and so on. And what that study found was that the investment returns through investment in developing nations far outstrips any investment returns you can get in developed nations. And this is one of the ways in which a country like ours could draw investment because the returns from the developed for the developed nations would be much higher. But it goes back again to that first point. If they don't have confidence that they, their investments will be protected, then they will simply not invest. So the consequences again to our, of our actions are very dire. All right, uh, the next question I think relates to um, the job market uh, for young graduates that are entering the, the industry. Um, the question says, uh, what advice would you give young civil engineers trying to choose a career path in the current socio-economic climate of South Africa? And how do we help improve unemployment amongst graduates? Yeah, OK. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite bizarre that uh, a country that has a fraction of the number of uh, uh, engineering professionals compared to developed nations and compared even to our so-called competitor nations, our other developing nations that are seeking investment. We have a fraction of that number um, to the extent that in developed nations around one in 300, I'm, I'm going from something Alison Lawless, one of our past presidents did uh, a lot of research on, Around one in 300 uh, citizens is a built environment professional, an engineering professional. Um, in, the, in, the develop, uh, in the developing nations, that goes out to, you know, maybe one in 600, one in 800. In our case, it's around one in 3,000. And if you look at black engineers, it, it goes out even further. It goes out to around one in 40,000. Um, so we, we don't have enough. And, and just to keep this comparison going with, with the medical fraternity, um, in, you find across the board that in developing nations, there are more doctors than there are engineers. And in developed nations, there are more engineers than there are doctors. And one of the reasons is that developing nations require doctors uh, for the reasons that I described, as Harry Seftel said, when you have enough engineers and enough infrastructure, there's less need for doctors because infrastructure makes the nation healthier. So, it's crucial, I mean, these are all reasons why it is crucial that we employ and put to good effect 
every single built environment professional we can lay our hands on. It's absurd that we do not. So, so that's not answering the question, it's adding to the rant. In terms of, of dealing with that, we, we need to be activists and we need to bring to the attention of the authorities and, and people who employ and put out infrastructure work. That it's, it's critical that we have more infrastructure in place and that's going to require every single infrastructure professional to be employed. In terms of career pathing, um, I have a view on that, which is that you need to reinvent yourself every three years on average, every thousand days. You must be able to write out your job description as you're doing now, and it must be significantly different from what you did a thousand days ago. And generally, that means two things. Continue to educate yourself, continue to learn, and broaden your knowledge. And the second area is to seek out those opportunities that allow you to express the, those, those, that knowledge. You need to become relevant and the best in every sector will always be employed and you just need to be in that portion. So it's difficult to get in and to get the employment, but once you are there, to stay there, you just need to be the best that you can be. It's not a competitive thing. It's not competing with others. It's about excellence. It's about setting the standards for yourself and then always adhering to that. And that will keep you both interested and excited because that's why you need to reinvent yourself every three years. And it also keep you employed, which is a good side of it. Thanks for that answer. Um, the next question is about um, innovation in, 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 in solving infrastructure problems in South Africa. Um, and the question says, uh, does South Africa appreciate innovation? Um, and once you find a solution that is innovative, what ways can you implement them in the community with help from the government? Yeah, I find it hard to answer that because in the past we have um, been innovative in some areas and we have been extremely poor in others. There's, there's one thought that comes to mind and that is, you know, if you take, well, you take any aspect of infrastructure, there's always very, very exciting new developments. My feeling is that as a developing nation and given the limited capacity that we have for infrastructure management, we must be careful that we are not first movers. So in, in innovation, uh, you, you have two broad categories. You have those that are quick adopters of innovation. Those are the first movers. They see something new and exciting and they want it and they, they grab onto it and they buy it. Um, and then you get another group who I call the fast followers. I think we should be fast followers rather than first movers. We should allow innovation to be tested and you should be sure that it works well, it's cost effective and so on before we adopt it. But then we shouldn't hesitate. Then we should take it on. So we should be fast followers rather than first movers. In terms of innovation developed locally, I'm very hopeful that Infrastructure South Africa, which is a new agency, um, will, will be more amenable to that. There is a downside to our, we have a culture of creating new agencies when existing agencies don't do their jobs. So a lot of work that needs to be done, we already have the, the ministries and the departments and the agencies that are supposed to do that work. But you'll find that when those people don't do their work, we create a task team and then a new agency that will fast track or, or prioritize, why do we need to do that? 
if people just did the work that was within their ambit, that they are mandated to do, then we'd be okay. Having said that, I do have uh, hopes that Infrastructure South Africa will begin to implement um, the kind of activity that is required to, to kickstart uh, what has become a very dormant uh, area, infrastructure. Okay. Um, in the chat section, there's a question from uh, Johan Rudolf, um, and he says, are you on a path of infrastructure provision for, for sustainable growth and urbanization in the water and sanitation sector, for instance? Uh, looking, for example, at the water, and water supply situation in Cape Town and the Amatole district in the Eastern Cape, um, apart from the meteorological factors. Okay, I'm not a water expert, but I, I do think that um, a lot of work has been done, particularly in, in Cape Town with the, you know, day zero that uh, we had. Um, I, I, I think I'll, I'm not going to be able to answer that any better than uh, a sort of a broad palliative, sorry. Okay, not a problem. Um, I think we still have about uh, 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes of uh, Q&A. Um, and I don't know if, if this will be possible, but perhaps to have our participants uh, raise their hand and then have them unmuted to ask questions directly. Uh, we do have a question from McDonald. I think he's unmuted. Yes, um, uh, Sam, my question is, um, do you believe that there's a difference in quality of the infra infrastructure that has been built recently compared to the infrastructure that used to be built 40 years ago or 20 years back ago? Um, there seems to be a poor quality of the infrastructure that has been put down now. It cannot survive the test of time, you know. And if you look at the infrastructure that was built 40 years ago, it's still standing strong in there. Is there any change in quality that is being put down now? You know, where are we going as an industry? Because things that we put now, they seem to be deteriorating far much quicker than the stuff that they've been put 40 years ago. Can you relate or is something that I'm just, you know, Curious about. Thanks. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> if you travel in Europe, you will see structures that are two thousand years old. Um, I mean, civil engineering is about six thousand years old, right? It started with the first settlements, and and we we still come across some of those structures, some of those walls. But a lot of those were built. Uh, as gravity structures, so they tend to to sustain themselves over time. Um, I do think that we need to think about things like design life. Um, there's a there's a balancing act between the robustness of infrastructure and the design life of that structure. So. If we make something that is meant to last 20 years and we make it so that it lasts 50 years, well, then, you know, you've, you've over designed it. And it might have cost you more. But having said that, I think to your point, one of the key, key criteria we need to include in our criteria for um, for uh, procurement of infrastructure is robustness, because we have such a difficulty with maintenance. Um, we need to include the criterion that says, how do we make infrastructure sufficiently robust without increasing the cost substantially, so that maintenance um, and early warning signals can be can be seen. Um, 
rather than something failing catastrophically or suddenly. So I'm not, I'm not sure that older structures are built to last longer and do last longer simply because they were better built. I think that they, they, they cost a lot more and they would cost a lot more to build that way today. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a toss up. Right. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for the question, McDonald. Um, I think we do have uh, space for one more question. So if there's anybody who would like to put up their hand and put up a question to Sam, now is the chance. I see uh, another hand up. Huh? Yeah, there's Omar Kado. I think it's a good question. Greetings, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. I am Makado Tony. I just want to ask a, a very simple question. As a young engineer, how can I easily become a professional engineer? What path can I follow? Where can I focus on that? Because it seems to be a difficult issue to ask a young engineers, like how can we become professionals? Thank you. I think, Karaba, you're more qualified to answer that than I am. The, the the academy. Yeah, uh, Saisi, has, yeah, Saisi does have a, a um, an academy that runs um, training on on registra registrations for PR. Um, it's quite a it's quite a, uh, a fully entailed course on how to get that done, and I would advise that you get in contact with uh, Saisi. Uh, they can share with you their training um, curriculum, I suppose. And um, there's quite a good success rate from the people who participate in that. No, thank you. I hope it helps. No, it, uh, thanks. All right, I think we're, we're done with the webinar. Um, just an announcement before we end uh, this session. Our next webinar will be on the 26th of August, and we'll have a presenter from Sanro, who's Ravi Roni. Um, and you were talking about upgrades to the N2 and the N3. Yeah, so please do look out for posters. Please do follow us on our social media. Uh, we will put up a poster and a registration link for that webinar uh, quite soon. Uh, so in closing, I would like to thank everyone for making time to join our webinar for today. Um, thank you very much to Sam for putting away his time uh, to make a presentation for every one of us here today. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers of the event, particularly Tom and Tabuleng, as well as Mishka uh, for putting together this great um, presentation. Um, again, please do follow us. Uh, please do follow the institution's <laughs> uh, uh, social media pages uh, and let's keep up to date with uh, all the work that we've been doing. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay, Karabo, we're going to just run those videos again in case people join late. Um, if they can stay on for a minute or two and then hopefully they can start to leave. Go ahead and double link. Just a moment, Tom.
it. Would you like to be an engineer of great integrity? The Engineers Table is here for you. A free platform for engineers to engage online, working closely with the grow a graduate aspect of SACE growing forward. Empower yourselves with the skills of tomorrow and be part of engineering breakthroughs of tomorrow. Engaging with professionals, generating ideas, revolutionizing industries, and creating the future. Let us help you build as you are built. with hundreds of South Africa's engineers. <laughs>